it's, I don't think ACEs should be seen as excuses. I think they are explanations. And I think they're also, it quite often uh, cuts people a bit of slack if they realize that, you know, various things that have happened to them have probably changed the trajectory of their lives. So I don't think it gives them an excuse or anything like that, but I do think it gives an explanation. Okay. So it is is adverse childhood experiences. Experiences, yes. Um, so, do you want to tell us what what that is? I I've got no clue what ACEs is. How would you how would you explain what it is to me? Well, an adverse childhood experience is something that actually um, affects us earlier on and changes something about us. Usually, something about our brain. What happens? Everything that we everything that happens to us makes us who we are. So every interaction we have, every conversation we have, every person we know, everything we do affects us and changes our brain pattern actually uh, quite a lot. So everything that happens to us is important and it makes us who we are. Now, if, if childhood experiences weren't important, we wouldn't bother creating a nurturing environment for our children yeah if it didn't matter we would just let them run wild and they you know feral behavior would be fine but we know on one level as a society that it's necessary for children to have safety and a nurturing environment so it's 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 not such a leap to then realize that if they don't have that kind of background they're going to have problems later on so those problems can be many and various. That doesn't mean that we should constantly be looking uh, that, you know, my mum dropped me on the head when I was a baby, so therefore I'm, I'm going to be a prized arse for the rest of my life. It, it's not about that. Yeah. But it's about understanding that what's happened to us has actually affected us. And it, I take it, I talk about it from a physical point of view, not from a judgmental point of view, but from a physical point of view. So when we, uh, our gene expression changes because of life events. The, right. gene, the gene itself doesn't change. The shape of the gene is exactly the same. So if you can imagine a gene like a, a, a tennis ball, okay. it, and if you roll it, you kind of know which direction it's going to go in. Yeah. If you add bits onto that tennis ball, you don't really know which direction it's going to take. So that's what happens to those genes. The genes themselves don't change, but uh, markers go on to the gene. It's proteins that get added to that gene that changes the way it works, that changes the way it's expressed. And so that's what adverse experiences um, do. They add proteins to the gene and they mean that you can't guarantee that you're going to go along that line. You may do, but there's no guarantee because, you know, it's no longer a role in tennis ball. And adverse childhood experience is not just, you know, my dad told me off once or, you know, I was... Yeah, really can I just say, I was going to ask you what, what sort of things would class as an adverse childhood experience, but I just want to say that if, if somebody watching hears something that might potentially be going on for them, it doesn't mean that you know, that child's yeah. life is in danger or anything. Because I, I, I know that one of the things is about um, single parent homes. And I think that is more of a, a common thing than it would have been when ACEs yes. first came about. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's not like a, if you tick one of these boxes, your life is going to be Certainly not. horrendous. Yeah. Certainly not. Other, if, it, if that was so, it would mean that everybody who's ever come from a single family or everybody who'd had a bereavement yeah. or everybody who'd been. But I think it is what what I mean, we've all had life. Everybody has life. Um, you know, I've had life. My life was pretty grim before you know and it, it isn't any longer but it was um I had six kids I don't suppose for one minute they would say that their life was perfect either because I was a single mother of six children yeah. so I know that that stuff will have affected them it doesn't mean that they will necessarily be like their life will be threatened but the kind of things that you look at are the kind that cause toxic stress 
not just short term stress, but toxic stress, the kind that kind of gives you nightmares and make, you know, the, that kind of toxic stress. And so you can have adverse childhood experiences and they can be violence, uh, experiencing violence, witnessing violence even can cause you uh, to, you know, to struggle. Uh, it can be neglect, it can be abuse, it can be any of those things that we know of being uh, able to cause a sort of a toxic stress for somebody. It's generally considered that you need to experience four adverse childhood experiences before you, you know, need to worry too much about, uh, about whether or not it's affected you. Having said that, I remember talking to a whole group of prisoners in a prison, we were talking about four uh, adverse childhood experiences and a couple of them said well four a day uh, because that was the reality of their lives you know so adverse childhood experiences it can be all of those things it can be having a parent in prison it can be losing a parent it, you know all of those kind of big things it can be adverse um, climate experience so if you grow up in a, an area where you're liable to have an earthquake or you've been subjected to a tsunami you know that could cause you can have um, adverse uh, community stress so if you grow up in a war zone um, you know if you you don't really know whether somebody's going to drop a bomb on you or shoot you I mean that is those are the kind of things that can cause problems in later life so do you think lockdown like I know that um, domestic abuse has gone up um, yeah. report cases so obviously there's going to be more things witnessed um, but do you think any other elements of lockdown could have an effect to the point yes. where it could be classed? I'm sure I'm, I'm, I think we're less we're yet to know exactly but it does make I mean I think there are problems I think it's not only the fact that people are at home and sometimes they're not eating properly and they may be getting more domestic violence but the other thing is I find that people walking around in masks can be quite, dis yeah. you know, you can feel uncomfortable. Um, I think kids feel uncomfortable with it. I also think that you're not picking up facial cues. You know, most of the time we are picking up such a lot of information from each other. We pick up facial cues. We know if somebody is a foe or a predator or a friend. Yeah. And a lot of that is because we're picking up that facial cue. Also, we're not hearing voices in the same way that we normally would. And we pick up cues from that. So I think that might have, a, it certainly wobbles me uh, because you feel a little bit ill at ease. You don't quite, you can't put your finger on it. But I think it's a combination of all those things. The uncertainty, uh, that feeling of the sword of Damocles hanging over you, the idea that you might kill your granny if you go in, you know, it's, there's all sorts of things that, uh, will worry children that far more because they've not experienced it before and we're not terribly good at reassuring them because we don't know either. So I do think lockdown will will certainly exacerbate, uh, you know, a lot of these things. I think it's a mistake to see all adversity as damaging to you because I think, as we've said before, adversity sometimes helps you grow so I think it's not about keeping people locked up in cotton wool and not allowing them to experience life because life helps us grow but there are occasions there are incidences that will cause problems for pe people in later life so for example I was adopted uh, and well I was bought actually somebody paid money for me I don't know how much I don't suppose it's very much but anyway the oh, point I'm is um, I don't feel like we can just skip past that <laughs> well it's true I mean you know I I, I had a few uh, you know adverse childhood experiences uh, but adoption to start with I mean I'm not suggesting that everybody who's adopted has a problem yeah. But it's very well documented that people who are adopted have abandonment issues dependent upon when they were adopted. And I was um, adopted a little bit too late. I was over six months old. And, you know, so it's not a good idea. to. And it wasn't handled very well. But this is a long time ago. I didn't grow up thinking I'd been abandoned. 
you don't you don't know that what happened but you grow up with a feeling because that abandonment issue stays with you right. so i grew up feeling like a square peg in a round hole i didn't belong anywhere i felt like a cuckoo in the nest but i didn't have the words or the history to put you know to to understand that so that that's an adverse childhood experience now that didn't make me an addict yeah i already had predisposition towards addictive behavior but then there were other, um, you know, adverse childhood experiences. This wow. phone, I am so sorry. Um, you know, I grew up in a fiercely Catholic background. I don't mean just an ordinary Catholic background. I mean the kind where everything but breathing is sinful. Yeah. So, you know, for example, I was told, I was, I was age six, when I was asked to kneel with my mum and her sisters to pray for a cousin of mine to die because he was about to, ex uh, to embark upon marriage with a divorcee. Now, his mother, my aunt, was told that he'd be better off dead than living in sin. Now, I was six when I was told to kneel down and pray for this cousin of mine to have a happy death. So all of my growing up years, I thought every time I put a foot wrong, somebody was praying for me to die. So I grew up very afraid, afraid of putting things, doing the wrong thing, afraid of, just, you know, all sorts of, it was just permanent fear. Um, so that's an adverse childhood experience. Uh, or, you know, that could be classed as that because I didn't have anybody to kind of turn to. This isn't about me, but it's an example. Yeah. Um, I was abused by a priest from the age of 10 until I was 13. Now, in my household, priests were next to God. They couldn't do any wrong. So for me to grow up with an environment where everything but breathing was sinful and priests were next to, next to God, and then to be sexually abused by one, that's a big adverse childhood experience. So by the time I was 15, I was a drinking alcoholic. I was already self-harming. I had an eating disorder. Uh, you know, I, I didn't know where I'd been or who I, you know, I was a mess. So I'm not suggesting that any one of those things, but we are a sum total of our genetic predispositions and our life experiences. So our life experiences can be difficult sometimes, and that's not a bad thing. But the kind of aces are adverse childhood experiences like being raped, like being neglected, like having several of those things happen and not have support. So I think really that's some what adverse childhood experiences are. And they don't mean that people are damaged beyond reparation, but it just means that if we behave in a certain way, then we can cut ourselves a bit of slack sometimes if we have an explanation. I mean, it made me feel a whole lot better about my background when I learned about this stuff. I no longer felt lower than a snake's belly in the grass. I no longer felt utterly ashamed of everything and guilt ridden and zero self-worth because it all made sense. It wasn't it's not a judgment and I don't blame anybody necessarily, but it gave me an understanding of why I felt the way I did and why my life was so difficult and how hard it was to get away from chemicals. So it gave me an explanation and it made me feel a whole lot better. Okay. So what, so the phrase ACEs, why was it created and what, what are ACEs for? Well, it's ju it was just created really to give people an understanding about um, the kind of things that can happen to people that might change their, the trajectory of uh, their, their life. And it was a fairly good way of looking at it, adverse childhood experiences. I think we can have adverse experiences all our life that affect us. Yeah. But of course, when we're children, we're quite malleable and we are forming our you know, relationships and we're forming our judgments and stuff like that. So, I mean, when we're children, our brain is still malleable. So what happens to us really affects us. So I think it was designed really as a way of explaining those particular occasions where you might experience, uh, you know, difficulties because of 
previous experiences. You know, they did a lot of research with epigenetics. So for example, epigenetics is the way, epi means on top of or at the side of or behind, you know, it's because. So genes don't change, but the epi bit is how we experience things. So if we have an adverse childhood experience and it changes that gene expression, then wherever there's a difference there, we can see epigenetics at play. Right. We know that things affect us. Epigenetics is just the way that happens. So they did a lot of research with this. So things like nutrition, um, things like uh, childhood trauma, and the other thing was mental health conditions. So looking at how they affect us late in later life. So to start with, they looked at nutrition. So they did a study about the Dutch hunger winter, which was a time in Holland towards the, the end of the last world war, uh, where everybody was a, a particular part of Holland where everybody was starving. I mean, they were, they'd been starving a long time, but this was real starvation. They were eating tulip bulbs and rats and anything they could get hold of because, you know, they, that's the way it was. Now, the one thing about the Dutch is they're very good at statistics and they're very good at keeping records. So when this, it's very unusual to see, um, you know, a whole group of people that are genetically similar because they all came from the same area um, have the same experience at the same time and stop at the same time. So you've got a good control study, which is a horrible way of looking at it, but it's useful. So they started by looking at people who were pregnant while they were starving. So they started by looking at women who were pregnant and they were starving in the last three months of their pregnancy. So in the latter stages, so in the last trimester. And they found that their babies were born underweight, which you would think is probably normal, really, because babies put their weight on in the last three months of the pregnancy. Then they looked at women who were pregnant in the early stage of their pregnancy when they were starving, and they found that by the time their babies were born, they they regained the proper weight. But because they're so good at following that up, they looked at those children as they grew up. And the children that were born with low weight never regained a proper weight and always had health conditions because of that. And the children that had, were starving in the early stage of pregnancy always had obesity problems um, all the way through their life and health problems because of that. And then because they're so good now and we're a little bit away from it, they looked at the children of those children and that obesity had continued or that low weight had continued. And now they're looking at the grandchildren. And I met two girls that had, whose parents were in Auschwitz and they were both Dutch. And they said that prior to the parents and grandparents actually going into Auschwitz, they were quite a rotund family, uh, you know, all well built afterwards all of the generations are really, really skinny and they didn't know why. And these girls said, we spend hours trying to put weight on and we can't, you know. So that's one thing they looked at. Then they looked at childhood experiences. So for example, if you were damaged before you were three, maybe, I don't know, beaten up or abused or whatever it might be, you will forget about the incident. Maybe then that child is taken out of the situation, put in a, a loving family, maybe valued and looked after well, and quite often adopted. And maybe sometimes that works, but statistically it doesn't work as well because the damage that's done earlier on doesn't manifest until later on. You've forgotten the incidents, you don't remember that happening, yeah. but you're left with that marker that's gone on to that gene expression. And then the other thing they looked at was um, mental health. They looked at schizophrenia and they, that was a twin study. And they looked at twins. And if one twin was schizophrenic, then it was found that uh, his twin was more liable to be schizophrenic 50% more liable to be schizophrenic than the rest of the population. And on the face of it, you'd think, well, that, that's probably right. But if you consider that twins are genetically identical, 
you would need to ask yourself, why are they both not? Why isn't it 100%? Yeah. But the reason is because they are different entities. Everything about us, everything that happens to us makes us who we are. So even those twins, although they were born at the same time, one might have been born first, the other one might have been second. Their life is different. Small changes will alter the gene expression. So even small changes can, you know, will, you know, people are trying to catch me, I'm not gonna look at it. Um, even small changes can do it. So all of that, st those studies have been done and it's getting to be, uh, I mean, it's a, I think it's a very complicated science. I don't pretend to understand it. Only the basics, even Kim, who's a neuroscientist, says it's a lot harder to, to get your head around than even brain science because it's a relatively new science. Uh, but it, you know, for example, uh, the abuse thing, um, I'm, I only ever talk about me because I'm not able to talk about other people's stories. Uh, but even that, you know, I've done a lot of work with uh, survivors of abuse. And it's generally considered that the damage caused, uh, certainly by Catholic clergy abuse like me, uh, you can expect a 20 year less life expectancy because of the damage caused to the brain, to the immune system. So you're more susceptible to serious diseases like cancer and heart disease. These are all researched things. So why I'm still alive, I don't know. It's just sheer bloody mindedness. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, um, you know, the point is that it, I, I don't feel sorry for myself, uh, but I understand it now. I don't think, oh, that's why I was a raging drunk and couldn't, you know, all of these things. Yeah. But I understand it. And it's knowledge is power, I think. So I think adverse childhood experiences are a fact. Uh, they change the way people behave. Doesn't mean necessarily that they behave badly. Sometimes it just changes the way they behave because they're a bit more wary or they're a bit more, uh, you know, hypervigilant or, you know, maybe uh, sometimes, you know, we might choose a partner because, you know, we're wanting to correct something. I don't know. But the point is they are a fact if we know about them and we can sort of think okay well that's okay I, I wasn't lower than a snake's belly in the grass I was just trying to survive yeah. I was just a struggling person trying to survive and often we carry around those burdens um, it just means you've got to try a bit harder it's not about self-pity it's about looking at the hand that you've been dealt and thought okay what can I do with the hand that I've got it may be not as good as your hand and it may be better than somebody else's, but it's mine and I'm going to work with what I, I can work with. Uh, so I think it, it's useful uh, it's to know about... It's useful for somebody to identify things within their own life or for professionals working with people who have been through stuff to get an understanding of theirs. I think it's important for professionals to understand it uh, because I think that there should be less judgment um, you know, I did. I went and did a a short sort of workshop thing a day with some of the people in the DSP in the Dangerous Severe Personality Disorder Unit, and you know these are prisoners that aren't coming out. So it wasn't about, and it wasn't making excuses for them at all or for the behaviour, but it made them understand it a bit. It was almost like it cut them a bit of slack. It was okay. All right, I understand that. I understand that that you know that that's the way it is, and I think if we understand why we are the way we are, we can adjust our behaviour accordingly, and we can do the right things to be well and stay well. I do think professionals need to understand these things, but I do think we should be very careful not to use them as excuses. Yeah, that's the danger. Yeah, it's and it, it is tough because if you're if you're not ready to recover from whatever it is first, yeah. I think, I think for me, the aces are good after you've, so let's, let's yeah. take our situation. So you get into addiction and I think if you were to find out about aces mid addiction, that will encourage you to use drugs because all these terrible things happen to you. And yeah. you know, aces is telling you that this is pretty much what to expect. Yeah. Um, but I think if you start to come through the other side and when you start doing step work, it's good to understand that 
you know, some of the things that you've done that you might have shame of might necessarily not have been 100% of your choice Absolutely. Um, or your understanding that you were doing this thing at the time. Um, but there's, there's just certain things where you can't, like there's certain crimes, you know, like your, you know, the abuser, if they were abused as a child, that doesn't, you know, you, they can't say, oh, well, it happened to me, so. No, no. You yeah. have to you have to be able to use the criminal you know they, it's a crime and and they need to be they need to be put in jail I mean that's the reality of it There's, it's not an excuse it's just an under, an explanation yeah. and I think also I agree with you totally I think if you're in the middle of your addiction this would be manna from heaven for me I'd be able to say oh you know I only drink my because fault. of this it's not my fault so I'm not talking about this as as giving that information necessarily to people who are, and, and I've always thought even before the idea of ACEs came about and I think I've always learned from others that it's wasted brain power looking at why things happen when you're in recovery you just need to look at how you can stay well and get well and get better then you can look back at maybe unravel yeah. that stuff because by that time you'll have enough uh, fuel in you and energy and balance enable to enable you to do that. Uh, so I think it's it's a difficult one. I don't think you should keep it secret because I think that secrecy is not good in anything. And I think knowledge is power. But I think well, it's a waste of time giving that information to somebody who's in active addiction because they'll just use it as an excuse. I mean, goodness knows we've all used excuses and you know, my mum dropped me on the head when I was a baby and my wife doesn't understand me. I'd be all right if I won the lottery. Yeah. It's because nobody's ever taken me seriously. I'm, you know, all sorts of excuses. So it's really not an excuse, but it is an explanation. And I found it very valuable later on in restoration to look back and think, and because if I hadn't been able to do that, I would never have been able to let it go. You know, I would have hated my mother because she adopted me and she didn't do anything about the abuse because she was too, she was too, you know, uh, sycophantic with the priest. I mean, she actually caught him at it and did do nothing about it. She actually told me to pray for him. I was 13 and she told me to pray for him and to offer it up. In my family, the saying was offer it up. The idea, if anything happened to you, you offered it up to atone for your sins. Um, so, you know, I was asthmatic. If I, if I couldn't breathe, I should offer it up. Uh, I broke my hip, I should offer it up. So there was this idea that anything that happened to you was of no consequence. You should just offer it up. So, you know, I would have hated her, continued to hate her, if I hadn't been able to look at this properly and know that she was a product of her own distorted upbringing it doesn't excuse it but yeah. it explains it and I can look after my recovery without having to carry that around with me really but it, it, it is difficult because the more we learn years ago we didn't know years ago before the advent of Neuro, you know, things like neural imaging, like PET scans and MRI scans. We didn't really know much about how the brain worked uh, unless somebody had brain damage or got, you know, was dead. We could open them up. But these days, because we can look inside and we can actually measure changes and things like that, we're learning more all the time. And sometimes that's scary, you know, uh, because the more we learn about the kind of things that have happened, uh, the more responsibility we we kind of have to to take on board because we now know how detrimental we can affect other human beings you know um the old idea that sticks and stones can break my bones but words will never harm me is absolute nonsense because you can be mortally wounded by things that are said to you and they stay with you and and so I think we're learning more about it. So I think it's still in its infancy. Yeah. Uh, and I do think ACEs, you're absolutely right. I think they're a fact. They do happen, but they should never be used as an excuse, just an understanding and an explanation. I much prefer to believe and know 
why I became uh, the raging addict rather than just, you know, not know. It, it doesn't suit me to, to, yeah. to not know. You described it earlier as a tennis ball and then little bits get added and it yeah. shapes and then it rolls in a, an inconsistent direction. Yes. If So if somebody's been through something and, you know, the, that tennis ball is misshaped, is there any way to make that tennis ball again? Let's say um, somebody who's been through domestic abuse has flashbacks in new relationships. Yes. I think if you know that you have it, you know, I think you can treat it better mm. if you understand where they're coming from. Yeah. So there are lots and lots of ways that you can make a difference. I mean, flashbacks are, are, are a typical, are a good what example, but it's flashbacks are something different. They're triggers, aren't they? That's largely due to something called long-term potentiation. What happens is when you are, if you learn to, if you learn to drive, or to ride a bike or something like that. Before you learn to ride up to drive, you've got like neural pathways going along, but they're slow because you know you've got to be in a car and you know it's going to go on the road. So you know a little bit about it, but not very much. But when you've repeatedly had lessons, then that that neural pathway becomes like a six lane motorway because right. your memories, you don't have a bag of memories in your head. That's not how it works. Your memories are the neural pathways that you've strengthened through experiences. And so my husband, who's just disappeared, um, he is a drummer and he's a very good drummer. He's been drumming since he was about knee high to a grasshopper. Um, and he still practices every day. Um, and he's an old man, like I'm an old woman. And on an afternoon, a Sunday afternoon, we often watch the telly and drop to sleep in front of the television. And um, some music will come on the television and he'll be spark out and he'll be completely dead to the world. And World War Three could happen and it wouldn't wake him up. But suddenly you can see the bass pedal leg going. <laughs> then you see the other leg going. Then you see the twitch because even <laughs> though he's asleep, <laughs> That's called long-term potentiation. So that's how triggers work. It's like Pavlovian, can, and that's how flashbacks occur. Right. So he doesn't know that that's happened to him when he's woken up. Yeah. I tell him, but he doesn't know. So flashbacks are the same. You know, something will trigger them and start off that, that neural pathway, that memory. Now, you can't change that pathway because it's happened. You can't have it not happened. But what you can do because you know about it, is you can create new neural pathways that become favoured. So yeah. that's where this rest restoration comes in. So we're doing all sorts of things to keep away from the, you know, addiction bit, uh, which is about long term potentiation as well. But we're trying to keep away from those neural pathways. I'm still an addict. There's no doubt if I were to take a mood altering chemical, I couldn't guarantee what would happen next. Mm. So that's still in there, even after all these years. So that pathway is still there, but I've created new neural pathways in my recovery and restoration over the years by doing all sorts of things with work on myself and work on my recovery. But if I were to have a mood altering chemical, all of that damage, you know, would could easily start off again. And flashbacks are the same sort of thing. There's a neural pathway that's been created. Uh, you, you can create long-term potentiation in two ways. One is repetition, and the other is a strong emotional content. So uh, you can, it, it will happen if you have a, a trauma of, of any great, you know, uh, a, a big trauma, perhaps, or anything with an emotional angle to it, or something that you repeat. And when you consider it, addiction is all about emotions. Mm -hmm. You've got repetition and emotional content as well. So that's why this long term potentiation pathway has to be kept away from. You have to keep away from that and build new ones, which is what you're doing, which are hopefully is what I'm doing yeah. uh, by creating other things which then take priority from our desire to 
get as high as a kite. We're getting higher, getting the helpers high, you're getting all of the other stuff, you're, you know, you're getting stuff that, um, you know, you wouldn't have had before. But that's how flashbacks work. They work because of changes in the brain, long term potentiation, in drained pathways. Oh, wow, that's amazing. So it's, it's just about replacing bad memories with consistent new memories. Yeah. Then they'll become. I, when you were saying that, I was thinking like on YouTube where it's like your suggested videos and it's all just things that are similar to the thing that's happened. So your brain will automatically associate those things with all the new positive things. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you will still, it doesn't go away completely. So given the right circumstances, but, you know, by the time you've been in recovery and restoration for any length of time, you're prepared for those eventualities. Yeah. So, um you know, I've occasionally had drinking dreams. Um, and I've well, I, with- I have regularly have using yeah. dreams for drugs. Yeah. And I, I, I love them. And I've spoke about this in meetings before and people think it's strange, but it's like with anything, you know, we've, we spoke before we started recording about um, how you, how you um, give out the story of prison. So I've been to prison and because it was a massive positive, I will speak about it in a positive way. There's no shame no, to me going to prison. And with using dreams, it's the same because every time I've had a dream about taking drugs, I've been dishonest. I've lied about it to my parents. And, you know, I'll quite visibly have like either Coke or whatever, there'll be powder on my face. And yeah. I'm stood lying to the person in front of me. Um, and I, I wake up with all this guilt and this shame. Uh, and I just think that's what it would feel like if I did take drugs. And it's like a, a free, a free pass. So now I know what that would feel like if I did take drugs without having to take drugs. That's right. It's a really positive um, experience. It absolutely is. Even I still have them. Not I don't have them every week, or every, but I have them. And when I wake up, I feel huge gratitude yeah. that it's not real. Mm. And it reminds me, because it's like I said, you don't remember, you don't necessarily have the incidents, but you're left with the feelings. It's all about feelings. It's sometimes you don't know what's been triggered, but you've got the feeling. It's like that feeling of the sword of Damocles hanging over you, a feeling of impending disaster. But I walked through life with that feeling of impending doom. And I didn't realize that other addicts felt the same thing, you know, but it wasn't that I knew what I was afraid of. But clearly there were incidents that had made me afraid. So it's about keeping away from those pathways and creating new ones that then become favoured. It's not just as easy as saying, OK, well, I'll do that then. You know, it's about practice, because if you think about it, they often say, don't they, that to become a master of anything, you have to practice for 10,000 hours. So yeah. like my husband, who's practised for far more than 10,000 hours, um, <laughs> And, um, you know, that's why he's so good at what he does. But if you consider that we used at, at the same level, it's, you know, and we created those pathways over years and years and years, very strong potential stuff, potentiated stuff. It's not going to be a case of do that once and it'll all go away. You've got to practice that. You've got to keep going at it. Do it time and time and time again to try and make those pathways become more favoured than the ones that you had before. But it's a physical thing, Phil. That's what I like about working in this way. You can measure it physically. You can see the damage. You can see how this works in a brain scan. You can see what happens with epigenetics. You can actually measure it. And it's a physical thing. It's not a judgment thing. Uh, because there's too much judgment, I think. And uh, you're not looking at things in terms of judging people. It's just a physical thing. That happened and there's a physical change and that physical change might cause another issue down the road. So it's a lot less uh, judgmental, I think. And it's a fact. It's not It's not another opinion or another way yeah. of looking at it. It's just facts. Yeah. Um, it's just the way to look at it correctly, really, and say, well, this is... Uh, this is what's happened. I've still got those pathways in me, uh, but I think over the years I've created so many more positive things that I don't need to fear them anymore. But occasionally, I, you know, I'm still vulnerable. Um, and sometimes I have to, you know, you have to keep your ego in check and think you haven't 
fixed it all and got rid of it all. It's about having a healthy understanding of what could happen. Uh, I don't know whether I've helped really with the aces. It's massively helped, even if it's just me. Like I, I, I was confused about the aces before we spoke and I just felt like, you know, if, if you'd been through stuff and you stumbled across them, it would make you want to just give up. Um, and after speaking to it, it's given me a massive understanding on the, the power of knowing the history behind why we might be the way we are and to not, not like we've said, as a way to excuse certain behaviours, but just to give an understanding of yeah. you know, why, why we might have felt a particular way or, you know, decided to make bad decisions based on, you know, whether it's relationships because of things that might have happened, you know, when we're younger. I was speaking to someone yesterday who was talking about always going for older men and they didn't have a father figure in the life and they sort of related things to that. And, you know, there's all these little um, subtle, subliminal things that happen that make us make decisions. And we don't know that that's what it is. We think we're making choices off our own free will. Um, right. And sometimes it's not always the case. It isn't. And, and there are so many influences. It's not just what's happened to us. It's the people we've had in our lives. It's our education, our background, our this, our that, our ancestors, yeah. where we've been to school. There's so many influences. But I was thinking really um, of this business about not using too much brain power on the whys of it. And it does give you an explanation rather than an excuse. I don't think it, I've never seen it as an excuse I think it's just a way of understanding. For example, I have always been hypervigilant. Yeah. Uh, even now, I can be hypervigilant. And I know where it comes from. And I don't need to give in to it. But I know what the feeling is. And I know where it comes from. I am very susceptible to things like smells. Some people have different triggers. A colleague of mine in Holland... He cannot be anywhere near anybody with a clergyman's collar on because he'll break out in a cold sweat. But that's what it does to him. It really triggers him badly. I don't, I don't do that. I don't have that. But I can be triggered by smells. So anybody who knows me knows that I buy everything according to smell. So washing up liquid, soap powder, anything I buy, I will smell it first before I come out of the supermarket. <laughs> is not because I want the more expensive, it's just that I'm very susceptible to certain smells. And I know where that comes from as well. Uh, so I don't fight it. I just make sure that I don't have that, uh, you know, in my life. So I don't like the smell of incense, uh, stale sweat and whiskey, because that has very clear connotations for what happened to me. The other thing I can't bear the, the smell of is wallpaper. Because while I was being attacked, I was scraping the wallpaper off the wall with my fingernails. And wallpaper has a smell when you yeah. scratch it. Can't be around it. So anything that smacks of that, I keep away from me. I don't have it near me. Um, but, uh, you know, that's just a thing. But I've learned that because I understand oh. my oh. trick. This, this, the, so in, I mean, it was nothing like an adverse childhood experience. It was quite, you know... The opposite it was just in in school my re teacher um so i'd be sat on a chair and he used to tell you off but he used to put his head here and he'd yeah. whisper in this dirty accent and the smell of coffee and tobacco yeah. i've never smoked or i've never drunk coffee right. because it just reminds me of his yeah. head being there telling me off yeah. and I, it was i would have been doing something to warrant a telling off you know, I'm not saying it was, you know, I, I was innocent in all this happening, but just that that thought when you've said smell then, <clears throat> but you those see, two things I've never done. Yeah, it's everything you see. It's everything that affects us, makes us who we are. So it smells, it sounds. I mean, I, you know, voices. Uh, I, my mum, uh, my adopted mother, had a particularly good singing voice. She was a um, contralto, which is... You know, she would, she sounded a bit like Barbara Dixon, actually. And I can't bear Barbara Dixon's voice, not because I dislike Barbara Dixon. And I don't think for one minute that she's an unpleasant person. But if I'm driving in my car and she comes on the radio, I have to turn it off. So, but I know that, you know, I know where it comes from. And I think, okay, well, that's fair enough. I'll turn that off and I'll keep away from it. So, 
it's about sounds, it smells, it's even things that we see, you know, they did, you know, for example, you remember 9-11 when uh, the bombs dropped in, uh, or when the, you know, the planes went into the Twin Towers. A lot of people died, obviously, but actually quite a lot of people survived. Mm. And they, they coped really well and they were relieved and they were well and they did all sorts of things they didn't have. And it seemed to have a great deal of detriment group that they studied anyway, any real detrimental um, reaction until they hit uh, a sunny autumn morning. And suddenly the smells and the sounds and the sun triggered that yeah. experience again. And, you know, they did another thing where people who'd had serious car accidents and couldn't remember uh, anything about them as often happens, uh, suddenly get a triggered reaction if they hear a particular piece of music because it happened to be on the radio when they had the accident. So, you know, all of these influences and things that we're experiencing all the time, you know, are interesting to know why we behave the way we do. You know, it's, I can be quite belligerent if I'm attacked. I mean, I can, I've got an armour of belligerence sometimes. I don't particularly like it. I'm not particularly proud of it. Yeah. But I know it was a survival technique that I used many years ago. I don't need it now. And sometimes it comes out. Um, but, you know, it's understanding it. It's not about excusing it. It's not that I don't try and work on it because I do. But it's a matter of understanding it. You, yeah. you know, it's, it takes the, takes the heat off it a little bit. Yeah. So it's been amazing to talk to you. Um, I, I genu I think we need to do this again and find out more about you because uh, this one has obviously been um, to focus on the aces and to give people an understanding of what they was about. Um, but I, I want to talk to you about the work you do and you know all that sort of stuff. So we definitely need to. Do well, that would be wonderful. I'd be really amazing. happy. Yeah. Yeah. I could talk about my work until the cows come home because it gives me so much joy and so much pleasure. And you can tell why, when you're talking about, I mean, what people won't know is that we just randomly spoke for over an hour before we even realised. <laughs> yes, like, oh, we need to, we need to record something. We need to quickly. Um, but yeah, I genuinely, I, you know, it's always brilliant to speak to you and it's always good to see you. And I really appreciate you coming on and taking the time to do that. It's such a pleasure. It's so nice to see you. And I'm rooting for you, Phil. Everything that you're doing is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You. So Thank pleased you that much. you're there. So you just give me a ring and a shout and we'll do it again. Brilliant. Thank you very much. So you're welcome. See Take you care. See you soon. Bye-bye.